life often presents us with situations where there's only one way out. And no matter how much we might dislike that way out, there's simply no other choice. So sometimes we find ourselves doing unpleasant and even humiliating things, as the French say, or maybe the Spanish, or Italians. Well, it doesn't matter. They always repeat the phrase, cesse la vie, which means, Welcome to the Dark Side channel. Dive into the world of human relationships, mistakes, and right decisions. Don't miss out. Subscribe and join our growing community. That's life. And what can you do? My father, Dylan Fisher, always used to tell me, there are circumstances and there are emotions, and they shouldn't be confused. He knew what he was talking about. My father worked as an accountant all his life. For the last 11 years, he had his own accounting business. Primarily, the firm's work involved conducting independent audit checks for private businesses and government agencies. Among his clients were tax offices, the FBI, and the prosecutor's office. There were two orders from the Pentagon, and my father was terribly proud of that. You probably think that our small family lives in New York or Washington if my father had such cool clients. Actually, no. We're nesting in the town of Sweet Home, Oregon. The skyscrapers of Sweet Home have a maximum of four floors, and most of the buildings are wooden. But our town is drowning in greenery and flowers, and the air seems to ring with purity and transparency. It's a small town and everyone knows us, and we know everyone. And when a Chevrolet with police emblems drives up to my father's office, everyone understands. Dylan is hitched again to check a potential criminal. Why do I call us an incomplete family? Mom died in 98, diabetes. I was 13 then. Dad took the loss very hard. He ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. He took a long time to recover from depression, and after burying his wife, he never got into serious relationships again. Well, not unserious ones either. For me, losing the closest person was a terrible tragedy. I closed up and mourned, crying into my pillow at night. And who do you think I studied to be and what do I do? Bingo, no need to guess. Of course, I'm a master of accounting and tax reporting, in short, an accountant, a paperworm. But what else was there to do? In childhood, I dreamed of becoming an astronaut, but childhood ended. And with it, the unattainable dreams disappeared. Dad insisted that I finish university in Dallas and start helping him. So it happened. I'm an auditor as part of one of the audit teams, with the prospect of becoming a team leader. You know, I like my job. Digging into accounts, invoices, and financial reports is akin to detective work. Always searching and fully focused. It's especially interesting now that I already know where and what to look for. Education, experience, and hints from my father helped me become a master of my craft. As my father once said, an accountant is not a profession. It's not even a way of life or a mindset. An accountant is a state of the soul. And I fully agree with him. I got married after graduating from university. My wife, Rebecca Nay Wilson, I can't say she's a beauty, but I sincerely loved her. Reb finished Dallas University a year before. Reb is the daughter of a government official, the head of one of the departments in the state's social services. Reb will never stoop to talk to an ordinary clerk or a store clerk. And if there are any difficulties, she'll call her dad and he'll sort everything out. Apparently, when she married me, she thought I'd inherit my father's business and she'd have everything she wanted soon. Or maybe she really fell in love with me. Well, at least she said so. Few people know that one of Dylan Fisher's bank accounts holds a tidy sum, $19 million, and it constantly grows with interest and new investments. But my father had no intention of giving up his business, let alone dying. He crawled out of depression, and all the time he used to devote to my mom, he now spent on work, and only on work. And my father didn't raise me with words and moralizing. He instilled in me the necessary qualities by his example. Now, I guess I should describe myself. In 2010, I turned 25, and I had been married for six months. What can I say about myself? Tall, slightly chubby. I just love cakes, muffins, and chocolates. Well, that's my weakness. What can you do? In school, they nicknamed me Donut. Those who tried to give me the nickname Fatso got a bloody nose and quieted down. And otherwise, I'm not bad looking. Boyish, curly. Girls didn't shy away from me. Although they didn't hang around me in droves, 
I was friends with many girls while studying, but they married other guys, and for some reason they never got intimate with me. They just talked to me more heart to heart. As one of my classmates said, Pierce, you're my favorite little sister. Well, what can I say? But Reb, she somehow immediately took control of me. And before I knew it, I was engaged. And right after that, married. Rebecca considered herself smarter than everyone else and was a staunch supporter of aggressive, militant feminism. From the very beginning, she started to dominate in our family. She even tried to boss around my dad. He didn't make a scene, just quietly took me aside and asked, Pierce, calm your wife down. He never liked her, and Reb didn't particularly like him either. After the wedding, he stopped coming to my house altogether. Oh, I almost forgot to mention. Two years before my wedding, Dad gave me a house. It's the estate of the old sheriff, Carl Graham, who retired and moved to his daughter in Pennsylvania, and he sold the house to my dad. There, on the second floor, there are four quite large bedrooms, each with showers and toilets. On the first floor, there was a luxurious bathroom and a laundry room, and there was a lot more there. For example, a small greenhouse, a garage for three cars, and two swimming pools. One kiddie pool exclusively for children, and the other 50-meter one with two lanes. Carl always dreamed of a bunch of kids, so he built housing with a view to a large family. But it didn't work out. Man proposes, God disposes. That's how life goes. What can you do? We agreed to hold another class reunion in nature. Not far from the city, there was an excellent spot where we often went as teenagers to have fun, fry bacon over a fire, sing along to the guitar, and cuddle with classmates. Almost everyone showed up. We were joined by guys and girls who were both younger and older than us. Over a hundred people gathered. Ken Cook and Philip Helms were there too. Stars of the school football team who had long outgrown amateur sports and were playing football professionally in the third league for the Wolverines team in Salem. You must understand perfectly well what American football is. Veterans of this game, retiring, have very few intact bones left, and they select guys accordingly, like walking tanks. And that's where this whole story began. I've read about women cheating with athletes and other stars. My story turned out to be a copycat one. Ken and Philip joined our campfire and were chatting with my wife about something. They were laughing and sipping beer from bottles. Then Reb whispered something to Ken, and they, holding hands, went into the darkness. I tried to stop her. Reb, wait, where are you going? She waved me off. I'll be right back. Reb, Reb! But she stopped paying attention to me. People chuckled and looked at me with mockery. I jumped up and ran after them. Arriving at the clearing with the makeshift campground, all I saw was the taillights of Ken Cook's departing Camaro. In a matter of seconds, reaching my car, I sat behind the wheel and turned the ignition key. Nothing. I tried to start my Ford ten times, but opening the hood, I discovered that the battery terminals were deliberately disconnected. And since only I and Rebecca have the keys to the car, draw your own conclusions. In the few moments it took for this couple to leave, they couldn't have disabled my car. So everything was done beforehand. Putting the terminals back in place, I dashed off in pursuit, but alas, they were long gone. There was no point in returning to the clearing, so I went home. But on the way, I changed my mind and turned towards my father's house. After describing the situation to him, I asked, What should I do, Dad? It depends on what you want. If you want to tolerate such antics your whole life, if you enjoy being pointed at and giggled about behind your back, then go home and calmly wait for your wife to satisfy the entire Salem football team and come back. I raised my hands in protest, but my father didn't let me speak. And if you want to remain a man, then there's only one way out. Divorce. But I don't want a divorce. I want to get my wife back. Then there's nothing I can do to help you. And I don't want to help you. Cutting off the horns of my own son is not my thing. You've been married for less than six months, and she's already pulling this kind of stunt. What's next? I was feeling like crap. I sat there for a long time, pondering my situation. And finally, I came to the reasonable conclusion 
that my marriage had fallen apart and couldn't be salvaged. So I've decided, divorce? What do I need to do first? My father sighed with relief. Thank God you're not hopeless. So first of all, first of all, go to the police station and file a report with the duty officer about your wife's disappearance. Dad, I know where my wife is. She's with Ken Cook. Ah, and where exactly is she with this Ken? And why are you so sure that this Ken guy isn't a maniac, a rapist, or a murderer? Son, use your brain. You'll need solid evidence of her infidelity. The best evidence is a police officer's testimony, and even better, his report. Do you understand my point? And so I went to the police. I wrote a statement and left them my phone number. You know, before, I don't remember until what year, you could only file a missing person report three days after their disappearance. Now they believe that in the first few hours after someone goes missing, there's the highest chance of finding them alive. The duty officer, Brian Ruiz, a local guy, asked, It says here that your wife left with Ken Cook of her own free will. But maybe... But I interrupted him and expressed the considerations my father had given me about suspecting Cook of being unstable and that my Rebbe might be in danger. Anything could happen. I was lying, of course. But what else was there to do? I spent the night at my father's. In the morning, they called from the police department and informed me that my wife had been found. She was at Ken Cook's house, alive and well. The last part was said with obvious mockery. My father listened to my retelling and set the next task. Pierce, son, go to the police and demand that they accompany you to Ken Cook's house to retrieve your wife. I hesitated. But what if she doesn't want to leave with me? You don't need that. The police should see your good intentions as a law-abiding citizen. Understand, no scandals and insults, no physical violence. Even if Cook hits you, don't get into a fight. You'll survive a slap. Then I'll record the whole scene on my phone. No, son, you won't do that. Filming in someone else's residence is illegal. He approached me closely and looked me straight in the eyes. You understand me, Pierce, son of Dylan Fisher? You understand me well? Yes, Dad, I understand you. Thanks for the advice. I'll do everything as you said. At eleven, with two police officers, a big black guy of intimidating size and a small white woman, I arrived in my Ford at Ken's old house. Ken had long been living in the state capital, but for some reason, he hadn't sold the house in Sweet Home. The owner answered the door in his underwear and an open robe. The policewoman informed him that my wife was in his house and that they would like to make sure she was okay. Sure, come on in, Ken said warmly, buttoning up his robe. He led our group into the living room. Three guys were sitting at the table in just their underwear. Philip Helms, Barney Garcia, and Michael Freeman, all of Ken's friends, all players of the Wolverines team, all graduates of our school, the pride of the town. Where's my wife? The company smirked mockingly, and Ken replied, that's something you should know, where your wife is. But Grace Svensson, the woman accompanying me, quickly cooled off these guys. All right, gentlemen. Last night, the woman we're looking for was in this house. Ken interrupted her. Lies. She wasn't in this house. So, according to you, Sergeant James is distorting the truth in his report? Or simply lying? Ken realized he had gone too far and started mumbling something. Then Svensson pressed. We suspect you're holding the poor woman against her will. Personally, I suspect you buried her somewhere. The guys faltered their eyes wide with fear as they exchanged nervous glances, and Ken blurted out, Just wait! I'll bring her right now! Rebecca descended into the living room in a men's robe, disheveled and with a hickey on her neck. She immediately lashed out at me. Pierce! What do you think you're doing? You're acting like an idiot! Why did you bring the police? Why are you humiliating me in front of people? Go home and wait for me. When the time comes, the boys will bring me back. Well, there you go. Rebecca is alive, well, and here of her own accord, Ken grinned. The police apologized and left. I followed them. On the driveway, Ken called out to me. Pierce, wait a second. He approached me and handed me some piece of fabric. I mechanically took it and saw that it was a pair of women's panties. This is for you to remember, Cook said, smiling cheekily. 
To this day I wonder how I restrained myself from punching him in the arrogant face. I tossed the panties aside and walked to my car. But what was there to do? On the way, Officer Grace questioned me. Fisher, for a betrayed husband you seem unusually calm. I suspect you're up to something. You think I'm going to do something illegal? Absolutely not, ma'am. It's not in my nature. Ask anyone in town, they'll all tell you I'm the most good-natured person. I really felt burned out. And my ex-wife became someone foreign to me. Someone I now had to defend against. And if I'm honest, turns out, I didn't love her that much after all. It was time to find a lawyer. My father's firm called someone and within minutes gave me the address of a divorce specialist. He delved into the case, drew up all the necessary documents, and handed me an envelope with the divorce agreement. Rebecca returned five days later, closer to evening. She, like a mistress of the house, walked in. She looked at me, sitting in the armchair in the living room, reading business papers. She said nothing, went upstairs. There was noise upstairs from the shower, the drawers of the wardrobe slammed, and my queen descended. You're not even going to say hello to me? I stood up and turned on the coffee machine. I needed to calm down and not show my agitation to my wife. Are you just going to stay silent? Rebbe inquired. I didn't answer. Pierce, are you being stupid? You're acting like a child. Stop playing the silent treatment right now. I ignored her attacks. What's going on? I had a little fun, so what? What's the catastrophe? Stop freaking out and order pizza and make me coffee with cream. I was quietly stunned by her audacity. The question needed to be resolved. No point in dragging it out. I took the envelope with the divorce agreement from the chair and handed it to her. And while she held it in front of her, I snapped a photo of Rebbe on my phone. What's this? She asked sternly. Read it. You'll find it interesting. She extracted the papers and only read the first page. Ah, uh, so that's how it is. Rebecca stood there, squinting slightly and looking me in the eyes, and then decisively tossed the envelope aside. Screw you, Pierce. Go to hell. She stormed out onto the street, opened the garage, got into her Mercedes, and drove off. And she didn't even close the garage door, damn her. That's just like her in everything. Well, good riddance. Thomas Wilson, my father-in-law. He called me on the city phone in the morning on Friday and demanded a meeting. No, scratch that, he didn't ask. He demanded that I come to Salem and show up at the State of Oregon Department of Social Services in his office. Thomas held the position of head of the Social Rehabilitation Department and considered himself a big shot. As always, I consulted with Dad, and he told me, go to Salem and talk to your father-in-law nicely. And what if Tom tries to run me over? Son, what's with the slang? Run me over. But I get it. If Tom starts getting upset, threatening, or demanding something, you calmly put him in his place, but without a scene. Well, I think you know what to do. And so I drove 65 kilometers to have a chat with my father-in-law. Well, my ex-father-in-law. But what was there to do? Wilson's office wasn't impressive. Well, it's understandable. A government institution. Sit down, Pierce. Coffee? No thanks, Dad. You know why I invited you, Tom began. I nodded. My girl made a mistake. She slipped up. But that's not the end of the world. And I think you should forgive her and stop this nonsense, this divorce. Rebecca is really upset. She deeply regrets what she's done and won't make such a mistake again. Well, 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 I should. At least Tom didn't say must. I interrupted him. Tom, you know, where's your daughter right now? She's an adult and I don't control her. That's not good. You should know. She's at Barney Garcia's house, a forward for the Wolverines team. She's up to something with Garcia and Michael Freeman, right at this moment. What's your advice? Tom blushed. That's not true. We can verify that. Get ready, let's go. They've just warmed up, and they'll be rolling around for another couple of hours. You have the opportunity to see for yourself how Rebby is regretting her mistake. I'm not going anywhere. What nonsense. I don't believe my daughter is capable of such things. Well, what can you say in this case? Tom, I understand that something's not right with Rebby's head. But I didn't sign up for this. If she were crippled, paralyzed, or disabled in some way, I swear, I would love and support her for the rest of her life. But as it is now, no. 
I'm not ready for such sacrifices. I got up and headed for the exit without saying goodbye. Pierce, wait, Tom called out. Thomas got up from his chair and approached me. Pierce, please forgive her. I'll talk to her and I'll punish her. She fell into the hands of scammers. Tom, I said to him, if your Daisy did the same, would you forgive her? Yes, I would definitely forgive her, but Daisy would never do such a thing. I smirked slightly. Well, well, of course not. She's a saint. She would never betray you. Tom became wary. You, do you know something? Pierce, if you know something, tell me. Tom sounded worried. Why would I? I bluffed. In reality, Daisy, my mother-in-law, was a wonderful woman. I genuinely loved her like my own mother, but I needed to put my father-in-law in a similar position. Why do you need to know anything about your wife? You'll forgive her anyway, so... Sorry, Tom, I'm wasting my time. I opened the door when Tom said to me, Pierce, you're unworthy of my daughter. You'll regret your words and your decision. I'll arrange for you. Oh well, I thought. If we're ending the relationship, might as well go all the way. I never liked Tom anyway. Thomas, you're a helpless father, a clueless husband, and a troublemaker. I'm disappointed. Goodbye. Well, that's that. Now what was there to do? The divorce was finalized in three weeks. Rebecca didn't show up for the hearing, only her lawyer did. We were divorced without any problems. My wife proudly didn't claim any property. Well, she couldn't claim anything anyway. And when the court session was over, Rebby's lawyer handed me a note from my ex-wife. It had the familiar message, Pierce, my dear, go to hell. I just smiled. I returned to my father with the divorce certificate. We sat silently in the kitchen, and eventually I asked, So, what do I do now? Dad replied, What do you do? Let me tell you. First, go to the gym. Who did I buy all those exercise machines for? All my employees work out there and you haven't set foot there. Let's hire a good trainer and you'll work on your body. You look like a bumpkin. You won't fit through the door soon. It'll be a good investment. And that's it? Well, I don't know. Look into pickup. No, not a car, but... Dad, I know what pickup means. I'm not going to chase after every skirt. But in the family... Pickup... Doesn't that seem strange to you? Pierce, let me tell you, my father said. A normal family life is a constant daily seduction of your own wife. You get it? Eternal pickup. To be honest, I was surprised by this approach. But my father had 15 years of happy married life, and I trusted his experience. For three years I worked tirelessly, trying to keep myself busy to drown out the little voice of my wounded pride. The company's business was booming. We were already in talks with a NASA representative about inspecting their Marshall Space Flight Center branch. It was a government contract, and they came to us, which said a lot. I saved all the money I earned in my account, and there wasn't much I particularly needed to spend it on. By 2012, I had earned my first million. The pickup didn't interest me. There was something sleazy about it, but I gleaned something from it. I carefully studied the brochure, the art of satisfying a woman, and made many discoveries for myself. I lifted weights in our gym until my eyes darkened. I pounded the punching bag until my knuckles were raw. In 2012, a capoeira school opened in our town and I enrolled. I didn't just go to classes twice a week like everyone else. I showed up every day, and the coach, seeing my dedication, started working with me on weekends showing and practicing some really sophisticated and deadly moves. Of course, not for free, but I still felt fat, clumsy, and unattractive. I didn't even try to make new acquaintances. Until one day in a shoe store, I bumped into Deborah Nelson. She had been in school four years after me, and I hadn't paid much attention to this girl before. But now, imagine a woman in her prime, a 24-year-old Aphrodite, chest, hips, butt, Simple yet enchanting facial features. No wonder the local football star Ken Cook married her. Yes, yes. That same Cook who destroyed my family. Of course, not without the help of my ex-wife. But still, his guilt was obvious to me. Rebecca Wilson. Of course, an outright fool. But that doesn't absolve Ken and his friends of responsibility. Deborah approached me, leading a little boy of about two by the hand. 
Oh, it's Pierce Fisher. Is that you, Pierce? I was embarrassed. Yes, Debbie. It's me. Hi. Deborah had always been a lively girl. She could speak the truth even to the school principal if she thought he was wrong. She wasn't afraid of a fight, and she never hesitated to laugh out loud. Debbie came up to me, stood on tiptoe, and kissed me on the cheek. Then swaying her head, she looked me over like a mannequin in a shop window. Pierce, you look like Superman. Honestly, where's your belly and chubby cheeks? You haven't just slimmed down. You, you've matured and gotten more handsome. Really. And there are probably no more chicks flocking around. Debbie, you've got me blushing. I don't have any chicks. I don't have time for them. She smirked slyly and shook her head. She didn't believe me. So, how have you been living? I asked. Well, can't say it's been good. We went to the nearest cafe to chat about life. Debbie's husband, as I mentioned before, Ken, left his wife in her hometown, in their house, and he was busy with training, camps, and competitions. He had a small apartment in the state capital, where he mainly stayed. Debbie didn't miss him. She danced, sang in the church choir, and spent a lot of time with her son, Jim. This little rascal was born. A spitting image of his dad, but with his mother's charm. Such a good little guy. But Deborah's house lacked male presence. Ken sent enough money for a comfortable life. But for something as simple as driving a nail into the wall, she had to hire a specialist or do it herself. She chuckled as she recounted how once her husband happened to be home, and she asked him to hang a group portrait of the Wolverines football team in the living room. Oh, Pierce, my husband is magnificent on the field with a ball. He juggles it like a wizard, Debbie said with a laugh. But with a hammer, he's a complete zero. Imagine standing on a ladder trying to drive a nail into the wall, and he hits his knee with the hammer, laughter and sin. In the end, I climbed up that damn chimney and hung the portrait myself. Yeah, like this. And Ken, in the meantime, was whimpering in the bathroom, applying an ice pack to his leg. I watched her white teeth as she laughed, feeling a renewed interest in women. Debbie, I think I blushed. Where do you dance? At hall dances. Why? Do you have men dancing there too? Of course they do. Do you want to learn to dance? Well, I'd like to, but I... Debbie smiled. But you're shy, you lack confidence, and you're afraid of ridicule, right? I shrugged awkwardly. Come on Wednesday to Stella Tyler's Hall and see for yourself. You'll like it, I assure you. I could even give you a couple of private lessons. Well, okay, it's time to go. Let's go, Jimmy. Let's go home, Bunny. I watched this woman walk away, enjoying her beautiful curves and gait. In other words, I was blatantly staring at her behind. She must have felt my gaze. She looked back, smiled, and wagged her finger at me. Debbie, always in her element. On Wednesday, I went to learn to dance. The room looked more like a gym. Stella Tyler, a woman in her forties, took twenty bucks from me and led me to a group of her students. Oh my God. Mostly gathered, there were gentlemen and ladies over fifty, all dressed to the nines, and there I was in a three-piece suit and patent leather shoes. I looked like a peacock in a chicken coop. Deborah flew up to me, pecked me on the cheek, grabbed my hand, and dragged me into the ranks of dancers, laughing at my appearance. I didn't embarrass myself. I had coordination and rhythm, and those dancers would have tried to do Kayata ten times in a row or dodge it. That's right. After the first ten minutes of the class, Stella came up to us with Debbie and asked, Fisher, you used to dance before, right? No, I replied. Never. That's strange, Tyler said surprised. You move very professionally. Well... I practice capoeira, probably that's why. I shouldn't have said that, because Debbie seized on that thought and suggested, Pierce, why don't you show us something from that, well, you know, that martial art? And Stella clapped her hands and announced, Attention, Mr. Fisher will now demonstrate some elements of martial arts for us. Well, goddamn, couldn't keep my mouth shut, I thought. But it was too late. Everyone gathered around me, clapping their hands and waiting for the show. So what to do? I demonstrated some poses, transitions, exits, and kicks for them. Ever tried doing the spin in a stiff suit and shiny shoes? No, don't even try. Total embarrassment. The trousers split right in the crotch seam. Lord, how uncomfortable it was. 
but the dancers liked it. They were all laughing like crazy and applauding. I apologized and rushed to leave. Debbie caught me by the car. Pearson, wait, hold on, let's go to my place, I'll sew up your pants. No, Debbie, it's not necessary, I'll take them to the tailor. Piers, Deborah got offended. I have a sewing machine. Do you think I can't handle a simple seam? Today, everything was against me. How could I refuse her? Cook returned to hall dances and left with Jim. He must have been playing somewhere while his mother was dancing. We got into our cars and Debbie drove ahead showing the way. In short, Debbie really professionally sewed up my trousers. And I, wrapped in a blanket, waited, sitting in a chair and chatted with Jimmy. Well, there you go. Ready. Debbie finished and handed me the trousers. I put them on while Mrs. Cook delicately turned away, thanked her, and, accompanied by the hostess, headed to my Ford. It was already dark outside. We stood on the driveway next to my car and talked. Well, you really amazed everyone today? The seamstress chuckled. Phenomenal performance. Pearson, you're so charmingly shy, I just want to hug you. Unexpectedly for myself, I said, Well then, let's, and hugged her. Piers, no need, Deborah whispered sternly, but she didn't try to break free from my embrace. Thank you for the trousers, I whispered back, and gently kissed her on the lips, and Deborah responded to my kiss. Then she came to her senses. Piers, no need, let me go. What are you doing? She sighed as I kissed her. Please stop. I haven't had a man in a long time. Don't do this. I gently touched her skin with my lips, holding the woman carefully, like a fragile vase. And Cook threw back her head, offering her neck for kisses. Then she suddenly recoiled. I thought it was all over. But it wasn't. Deb grumbled. Oh, damn it. Screw it all. She opened the back door and pushed me into the back seat. Ten minutes of frantic pace and she soaked the seat and suit with sweat, breathing heavily. Cook pushed me away. Without a word, she jumped out of the car and rushed into the house, and I sat for a while, coming to my senses, and then headed towards my bear's lair. How did I perceive this crazy encounter? You know, it's twofold. On the one hand, it was like a godsend, and on the other hand, I felt like I got back at that bastard Ken. But Deborah Cook entered my heart. I constantly thought about our closeness and couldn't concentrate on anything else. The stockings and lingerie that Deb left in my car, I didn't return to the owner. Call me a fetishist, but having Deb's underwear in my glove compartment, in a separate bag, warmed my heart. The next time I came to dance class, Deb was acting cold and dancing more with other partners. I wasn't offended, but there was no point in joining that group anymore. 